This is going to be Revelation chapter 6, and this will take us through the first account of the time of Jacob's trouble, which you know as the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 6, many believe that the seals are not the wrath of God. So in this study, I want to prove that they are the wrath of God. I also want to present this study to you with a theme. The Hollywood crowd loves to make disaster movies like 2012 and The Day After Tomorrow. And I want to show you God's disaster movie in Revelation chapter 6. But the thing is, this isn't a movie. It's the real thing. So go to Revelation chapter 6 and look at verse 1. Notice that it says, The Lamb opens the seals. I believe this proves that this is the wrath of God. Revelation 6, 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Notice the beast said, Come and see. So God doesn't just tell John the events of these disasters. He has shown them in probably HD, full color, possibly even virtual reality. The first scene in this God's disaster movie, if you want to call it that, will reveal a villain. Every Hollywood movie has a villain. And many times this bad guy will start out looking like a good guy. And that is exactly like this character that shows up in verse 2. It says, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the bad guy will look like a good guy. Many commentators today will make the mistake of making this bad guy a good guy. They will make this white horse rider in Revelation chapter 6 the white horse rider of Revelation chapter 19. But let's compare both of these white horse riders side by side and see how these men are the opposite of each other. Revelation 19.12, the white horse rider, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, has many crowns, while the white horse rider in Revelation 6.2 just has one crown. Revelation 19.15 shows us that Jesus Christ has a sword, but this character in Revelation 6.2 has a bow. The white horse rider, Jesus Christ, in Revelation 19 has a kingdom that follows him. The rider in Revelation 6.2 has famine, death, and hell that follows him. Notice that he has a bow, but yet he has no arrows. This is because this villain comes in peaceably. And that is what the Antichrist does. He comes in peaceably and obtains the kingdom by flatteries. So the writer in Revelation 6-2 is none other than the Antichrist. He is a bowman. I heard Ruckman point out that this sign of a bowman is a peace sign. And that is how the Antichrist comes in, peaceably. And I started thinking about this and that is exactly what the world wants today is world peace. But without the Prince of Peace... There will be no peace. People want world peace without the Prince of Peace. And this selfie generation will post pictures of themselves with peace signs. And many times God will be angry with his people over sin. He will stir up adversaries against them, similar to how he did King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11. And that is what is happening here. God raises up the Antichrist and he will go against his people, in the book of Revelation. But moving on, the next scene in God's disaster movie is war. Men love war, and they love action movies. And the Bible has all of those things. Revelation 6, 3, and 4 says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And so this is where we get the saying, A horse of a different color. But there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So this red horse rider is going to break the peace that the first rider brought. And Jesus Christ spoke about wars and rumors of wars in Matthew 24. This lines up completely 
with this in Revelation 6. I want you to notice that power was given to him. That is the red horse rider to take peace from the earth. If power was given to him, then where did the power come from? It came from God. This red horse rider has to get his power from God, just like Satan has to get his power from God. God will use wicked men and wicked spirits to fulfill his will. And imagine the violence of these wars in the time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus says in Matthew 24, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You are going to have bloodthirsty soldiers who hate people. And there will be natural killing machines. Killing will be as easy as breathing for them. And they will kill you without any conscience. Just like a cat kills a mouse. They're not going to feel bad for killing you or your children. A brother in Christ that I like to listen to pointed out that this rider takes peace from the earth. And the lamb opened the seal of the red horse rider. So this is in contrast to the Pauline epistles where Paul always says grace to you and peace from God our Father. So you have God taking peace from the earth in the time of Jacob's trouble. So you have a difference between the age we are in now and what you call the tribulation. In one age, God is more about peace. And then in this age, he is all about taking peace from the earth. I thought that was an interesting thought. But remember, power was given to this red horse rider and a sword was given to him as well. God gave us his only begotten son and his mercy to those who will accept him. But he also gives power and a sword to a person who will use it to hurt people. He does this very thing because he is angry about sin. And the next scene we would see in God's disaster movie is a famine in the land. Revelation 6, 5 and 6 says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him, had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The black horse rider has a pair of balances in his hand. And balances are used to weigh goods. Like when you go to the grocery store and you weigh the produce. The wheat and barley are going to be scarce in this time period. And notice that in Matthew 20 and verse 2, a penny is a day's wage. So it says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. A measure will be one meal for one man. And I believe the see thou hurt not the oil and the wine has to do with rich people getting along just fine in this time period because the oil and the wine isn't hurt. And in the, in the movies... The action happens so fast that the only real trouble is the disasters that are going on around them like the earthquakes and the tornadoes. But in this time period, you're going to have a lack of food with all the other things that are going on around you. And you think a famine can't be the wrath of God because all these guys are, are saying the seals aren't God's wrath. But a famine can be the wrath of God and it is here in Revelation 6. But look at Deuteronomy eleven seventeen. It says, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So a famine can be the wrath of God. And the next scene in God's disaster movie shows us literal hell on earth. Before my salvation, I watched a lot of movies, and I remember movies like Jumanji, where the game comes to life and all hell breaks loose on earth, and there were stampedes of wild beasts and monkeys and spiders, and this is a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble. There was also a man hunting them down trying to kill them in the movie, and God's people in the time of Jacob's trouble will be hunted down and killed. All these movies are just the devil's way of trying to copy the bible and a lot of the stuff that happens is stuff that's actually going to happen in the future 
and that's prophesied in the book of Revelation. The Bible says there is no new thing under the sun. Revelation 6, 7, and 8 says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sit on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So you have death and hell personified. And this is where you get the saying, all hell broke loose. But there is death and hell. And power was given unto them. By who? Obviously by God. And this isn't just man going against man. It is God using wicked men against men. Notice they kill with the beasts of the earth. There are animals coming out and killing people. Compare this to movies like we talked about just now, Jumanji, The Birds, Eight-Legged Freaks, or any movie with animals killing someone. And a lot of the old-timers will talk about in the last days the animals will come out of the woods into the cities. And this is the only verse I can find that resembles that. Not sure if it's the best connection, but I have noticed this a lot recently. In my own hometown, I'm constantly seeing coyotes out in the street, and they would just jump out in the middle of the road and stare at me. And a couple of years ago, I was driving past a movie theater late at night, and there was about 15 deers in the parking lot right out in the city. And this will be a common thing in the time of Jacob's trouble, but the beasts will be attacking and killing people. And the next scene in God's disaster movie is good guys being killed. Most times in movies, they will make it appear that the good guy is losing for dramatic effect. And many times in Hollywood movies, they will kill off a good guy for dramatic effect at the beginning of the movie. And this happens here in the time of Jacob's trouble. Many of God's people are going to be killed. And Matthew 24 talks about men in Judea fleeing to the mountains. And those Jews are going to stay, are going to see the Antichrist stand in the temple claiming to be God Almighty. And they are going to realize he is a fake because they know they aren't supposed to worship an image. He will begin to bring the mark of the beast and anyone who doesn't take it will be killed. And that is what happens to these people of God who are slain for the word of God. And they are beheaded. Revelation 6, 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And the men who don't believe the seals are God's wrath will say this verse proves that they can't be the wrath of God. And they will point out 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, which says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. They will take this verse here in Revelation 6, 9 and say, God's people aren't appointed to wrath, and you have God's people being slain for the word of God in the fifth seal. So they'll say, well, therefore this proves it isn't the wrath of God. So you see how slick they are? They will use a truth to prove a lie. It is true that we aren't appointed to wrath, but the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 is talking about born-again believers in the body of Christ, not about Jewish saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, or any saint in the time of Jacob's trouble that's not part of the body of Christ. Any slick false teacher will use truth to teach lies. Uh, the fifth seal has to do with the martyrdom of Israel, not born-again believers in the body of Christ, which aren't appointed to wrath. You think Israel can't get the wrath of God? Look back to that verse in Deuteronomy eleven seventeen. It says, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. And then in Exodus thirty two eleven it says, And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Thy people being a reference to Israel which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. God's people in the Old Testament aren't born-again believers in the body of Christ who aren't appointed to wrath. And God's people in the time of Jacob's trouble aren't born-again believers in the body of Christ, the body of Christ left in the rapture. 
The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't rightly divide, then you're not studying correctly. And these men will say, Dispensationalists aren't studying the Bible, they're studying, studying a man's system. But that's not true. The Bible shows us there are divisions in the Bible, and they have a system of study that wants to blur the divisions. But these men are slain for the word of God. They kept the word of God and died for it. And their souls are under the altar. In verse 10, they are crying with a loud voice for God to avenge the blood on them that dwell on the earth. So you can see that imprecatory prayers come back. And that's another difference between the time of Jacob's trouble and the church, the church age we're in. Because we don't pray imprecatory prayers. We play, pray good things toward our enemies. A good example of a imprecatory prayer in the Old Testament is in Psalms 55.15. It says, Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. This isn't something that we as Christians should do today. This brings us back to right division. The men who want to blur that line of division will tell us to pray for people to go to hell. They will talk about hating people and pray to God that bad things happen to people. But they are liars. Because Jesus tells us this in Matthew five forty three through 44, Ye have heard that it, hath, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now this is technically still Old Testament since Jesus hadn't died yet. But even Paul in the New Testament says this in, Rev or in Romans twelve twenty through 21. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So Paul wasn't praying for people to go to hell. He wasn't getting up while preaching and proclaiming that such and such person should go to hell. Paul which wished himself accursed if his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh, would be saved. He didn't want people to go to hell. He wasn't praying for nobody to go to hell. And then in Romans twelve fourteen he says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And when Stephen was stoned to death, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He didn't say, Lord, let death seize on them and take them to hell. Only someone who doesn't want to rightly divide will take David's prayers over Romans twelve fourteen, And they are doing nothing but making it harder for Christians to be effective witnesses. Christians are already seen many times as hateful, self-righteous people. And telling everyone we should pray for our enemies to die and go to hell does nothing but make us look even more evil to the world. And that when you say that stuff, it just makes you look like the Westboro Baptists. And this movement that's saying all this stuff, who pushes the prayers like David prayed for this age, I believe they are saved men with a lot of zeal, but I believe they are being used by the devil to get our rights taken away and our King James Bible is taken away. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe these prayers will return. And most false doctrine is a Bible truth for another dispensation. So to put the impeccatory prayers for us today would be putting it in the wrong dispensation. Revelation 6.10 says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So you are going to have a mass killing of God's people. But moving on, the next scene in God's disaster is an earthquake. The sun becoming black and the moon turning to blood. You're going to have stars falling from the sky and the heaven being rolled back like a scroll. If you look at Revelation 6, 12 through 14, it says, And I beheld, he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, 
and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And this matches Matthew twenty four twenty nine through 31 perfectly, which is Jesus Christ coming back to gather together his elect. Not after the tribulation, but after the tribulation of those days. Tribulation isn't a title of the time period. It is a description of what the, the time period is. Look at Matthew twenty four twenty nine through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great son of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now remember, there's more than one elect. Israel is referred to as the elect. Born-again believers are elect. But Matthew 24 is Old Testament. Jesus hasn't died yet. Why would you refer to the elect as the body of Christ when there isn't even a body of Christ yet? Jesus hadn't died for the body to even start. And then Revelation 6.14 says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. God made the heavens... He made the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. And the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. He is the artist, and he can roll his crea creation together like a scroll. It would be nothing for God to do something like that. Jesus talked about having enough faith to move mountains. At the second coming, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, who will all have the power to move mountains. And I believe the next verses describe the events of Jesus Christ coming back on the day of the Lord with ten thousands of his saints. And this chapter took us through the first account of the time of Jacob's trouble. The wrath isn't just in verse 17. Verse 17 is the day of his wrath. He poured his wrath out all, all the way through it. But the day of his wrath is referring to the day of the Lord primarily the second coming. The mountains and islands are probably moved out of their places by the earthquake spoken of in Revelation 16, 8 through 18 through 20. And Revelation 6, 15 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. So God is no respecter of persons. Every class of unbeliever will be in danger of being slain with a sharp two-edged sword. Notice it says every bondman, showing that slavery will still be taking place, and they are hiding in, uh, in the dens and rocks of the mountains. Even today, men are getting luxurious underground bunkers. But how is this going to protect them from the earthquake? Revelation 6 16 and 17 says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, the great day of his wrath. And who shall be able to stand? The men who teach that born-again Christians go through the first half of the time of Jacob's trouble will call the seals of chapter 6 the tribulation. And they say Revelation 6.17 starts the wrath of God. And since born-again believers aren't appointed unto wrath, this is where they're taken out. And they believe this is where they get raptured out. And then the last three and a half years are God's wrath from Revelation 7-11. through 11. But this doesn't make any sense when you compare Revelation 6.15-17 through 17 with Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, 17 and 18 says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and the idols he shall utterly abolish. And now here it is in verse 19, talking about the same event of Revelation chapter 6. 
It says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to, to shake terribly the earth. But notice in Isaiah 2.17, it says, The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Look at it again. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. What happens on that day? They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. Just like in Revelation 6, it matches. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's not when the, It's not that this is the middle of the seven year period and the wrath is going to start because it says the Lord alone is going to be exalted in that day. The Antichrist isn't going to be exalted. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. The end of Revelation chapter 6 is obviously the second coming of Jesus Christ and ends the first account of the time of Jacob's trouble that we find in the book of Revelation. And if you disagree, then that's fine. If you think that there, that the book of Revelation is just one big account of the, the tribulation, then that's fine. But I just don't see any other way around it, comparing Scripture with Scripture, how that isn't the first account going all the way through the tribulation. And they will try to refute this by saying that Revelation chapter 7 starts out with John saying, And after these things I saw, because in Revelation 7, 1 it says, And after these things I saw, but these things are future and John isn't necessarily seeing these things in chronological order himself. He is being shown things by God. Why they aren't in chronological order isn't my concern. It is God's Bible. It isn't my fault that the book of the Bible, that every book of the Bible aren't in chronological order themselves. It isn't our fault that he wrote four Gospels that give four accounts of Jesus' life. That is just how God decided to do it. And if you have a problem with it, then you can take it up with God. Just because you would have wrote the book of Revelation in chronological order doesn't mean anything. God does things different. And Isaiah 58, or Isaiah 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. But this has been Revelation chapter 6.